Albert Einstein once joked that taxes are too difficult for a mathematician. Hmm. They require a philosopher. So if one of the most brilliant scientists to ever live had a tough time figuring them out, what hope do the rest of us have, right? There are certainly a lot of different rules to remember, especially when it comes to your investments. But we're hoping this lesson will provide a little more clarity about how your portfolio is taxed, so you may crunch numbers like a mathematician and ponder how to reduce your tax burden like a philosopher. Now, before we dive in, it's important to note that everyone's tax situation is unique. If you have questions, it's best to consult with a tax professional. With that said, let's get to it. The first thing to understand is that different types of investments are taxed at different rates. Take for instance interest-bearing assets for starters. Some examples include GICs, real estate investment trusts, US Treasury bills, bonds, even the interest earned from your bank savings account. They all generate a distribution that's considered income in the eyes of the Canada Revenue Agency. And 100% of it is taxable, whether it is reinvested or not. There are also no tax credits available for interest-based income specifically. So, many investors choose to shelter these investments in tax-free or tax-deferred accounts, such as an RRSP, RESP, or TFSA. It's a different story for income derived from Canadian dividend stocks and ETFs. Some larger corporations pay out dividends using their after-tax dollars as a reward to shareholders. These are called eligible dividends, and they're taxed at much lower rates than interest-based income. The combined federal and provincial tax rates on Canadian stock dividends depends on where you live, but it ranges between roughly 28 and 43% as of 2021. There are also tax credits available for this income that can make dividends highly tax efficient. Again, the dollar amount differs between the provinces and territories, but in most provinces and territories, Canadian residents with no other sources of income can earn about $50,000 in Canadian stock dividends without paying any tax at all. Even if you don't live in one of these locales, fear not. Many Canadians shelter their dividend income in a registered account like an RRSP or TFSA. Now, there's a wrinkle to this when it comes to dividends paid by foreign companies. Those investments don't qualify for Canada's dividend tax credit. Instead, they are fully taxable, just like interest-based income. The rate you'll pay is tied to the marginal tax bracket you fall under. But that's not all. Foreign dividends may also be subject to withholding taxes from whichever country the company is domiciled. For example, let's say you hold shares of a Japanese company that pays a dividend. Come tax time, you would be subject to the tax agreement that Canada and Japan have worked out. In some cases, foreign countries recognize the tax-exempt or tax-deferred status of registered Canadian accounts. So you wouldn't pay a withholding tax on any dividend-paying shares from that specific country if you held those shares in, say, an RRSP. But for other countries, you may need to pay a withholding tax on dividend income earned from companies domiciled there. And there may not be a foreign tax credit you can claim. Of course, this wouldn't be a lesson on tax if there wasn't yet another wrinkle to discuss. And this one concerns dividends from American companies. The United States recognizes the tax-deferred status of an RRSP, but does not recognize registered education savings plans or TFSAs in the same way. That means any US-based dividend stocks you hold in them will face a 15% withholding tax. And you also won't be eligible for a foreign tax credit. If you choose to hold US dividend stocks in a non-registered trading account, you'll be hit with a 15% withholding tax. But on the bright side, you'll be able to claim the foreign tax credit. It's a similar case for US corporate bonds held in non-registered accounts. Any interest they generate is subject to 10% withholding tax, but they're eligible for a foreign tax credit. Then there's the issue of Master Limited Partnerships, or MLPs. They aren't dividend stocks per se, but they do pay distributions and they don't enjoy favorable tax treatment, period. You'll need to cough up a 39.6% withholding tax no matter which type of account they're held in. Plus, they're ineligible for foreign tax credits. Now, there's another type of distribution to watch out for called a return of capital. It's a feature of certain REITs, mutual funds, and income trusts. Like the name implies, it's when the fund or trust delivers a piece of your initial investment back to you. A return of capital isn't considered income, so it isn't immediately taxable. However, it does lower something called the adjusted cost base of your investment. It's a little complicated to explain, so we can dive into more detail in a later lesson, 
But in a nutshell, your cost base is your original purchase price. And each time you receive a return of capital, it reduces or adjusts that cost base. If you hold that particular investment long enough, your adjusted cost base will eventually reach zero. From there, any additional return of capital will be taxable as a capital gain. If you hold this type of investment in a tax sheltered account like an RRSP, you won't need to worry about this until you withdraw funds. But in a non-registered account, it will absolutely factor into your taxable income. Speaking of capital gains, let's turn our attention there for a moment because they can be a major consideration for your taxes. We'll discuss them in more detail in our next lesson, but we'll touch on the basics here. A capital gain is the amount an investment's value rises from the time it is bought to the time it is sold. So anytime you sell a capital asset for more than you purchased it for, be it a stock, bond, real estate, or whatnot, you will need to pay a capital gain tax. For both Canadian and US-based assets, currently 50% of the dollar amount you realize must be added to your total income. From there, you'll be taxed at whatever marginal tax bracket you fall under. Unless, of course, that investment is held within a registered account like an RRSP. In that case, you'll only pay tax on the funds once they're withdrawn. Of course, not every investment pays off. Sometimes, you'll sell an asset for less than you bought it. When that happens, you'll record a capital loss. And there's a silver lining. You can use capital losses to offset capital gains each fiscal year. And if you still have leftover losses, you can retroactively apply them up to three years for a refund. You've probably heard of investors selling unprofitable investments at the end of the year. Now you know why. Keep in mind though that this applies to losses on capital assets, not your principal residence. If it sounds like a lot of legwork to track capital gains and losses, that's because it can be. Thankfully, most financial institutions provide annual summaries and tax documents to help you keep track in most cases. Okay, so now that you're up to speed on the common ways your investments might be taxed, you're probably wondering how you can put all of this information to good use. For that, check out our next lesson, Building a Tax-Efficient Portfolio.